The fact that millions of people share the same vices does not make these vices virtues. The fact that they share so many errors does not make the errors to be truths. And the fact that millions of people share the same forms of mental pathology does not make these people sane. The Sane Society by Eric Frum. Published back in 1955, is a critique of modern society and a call for a shift towards a more balanced and humane society. The work examines the psychological, social, and economic factors that contribute to the collective insanity that he believed to be prevalent in modern society, and offers insights into how we can possibly obtain sanity and well-being. Eric Fromm defines a sane society in the following manner: A sane society is that which corresponds to the needs of man, not necessarily to what he feels to be his needs, because even the most pathological aims can be felt subjectively as that which the person wants most, but to what his needs are objectively, as they can be ascertained by the study of man. He states further that mental health is achieved if man develops into full maturity, according to the characteristics and laws of human nature. Mental illness consists in the failure of such development. From this premise, the criterion of mental health is not one of individual adjustment to a given social order, but a universal one, valid for all men. Of giving a satisfactory answer to the problem of human existence. From these statements, we can see that Eric Fromm believed that there are certain needs that all of us have as humans that need to be met in order for us to live a sane life. He specifically lists and discusses five human needs in the work, and they are the following: relatedness, transcendence. Rootedness, sense of identity, and frame of orientation. We will see how all five of these are interrelated and feed off each other. Now, let us take a look at each one. Relatedness and narcissism. The insane person is the one who has completely failed to establish any kind of union. And is imprisoned, even if he is not behind barred windows. The first human need that Eric Fromm mentions is relatedness, which is basically how an individual forms a relationship or union with other individuals. In his work *Escape from Freedom*, which was previously covered on this channel, he stated that a lot of people are in symbiotic relationships. These relationships are formed. By a submissive individual and a sadistic individual, and they need each other to feel complete, never becoming healthy, independent individuals. Fromm concluded that this type of relationship essentially acts as a coping mechanism against the burden of freedom, and is a very unhealthy form of relationship. He instead advocates for genuine love between individuals. The main reason for this is that in a symbiotic relationship, an individual's self-worth and perceived value is dependent on the other party, whereas in sincere love, both individuals can maintain their integrity and identity. There is only one passion, which satisfies man's need to unite himself with the world, and to acquire at the same time a sense of integrity. In individuality, and this is love. Love is union with somebody or something outside oneself, under the condition of retaining the separateness and integrity of one's own self. Those who fail to form proper bonds and union with other individuals end up alienating themselves from their community and surroundings. Eventually, leading them down the path of narcissism. But to be more precise, it's not so much that those individuals turn narcissistic, 
but they never grow out of what Sigmund Freud referred to as primary narcissism. According to Eric Fromm, who references Freud several times, an infant can only experience reality as their own body and their needs. The world isn't seen objectively or in a particularly meaningful way, as others and surrounding entities are perceived as means of satisfaction of the infant's needs. This state is what Freud called primary narcissism. The people around the infant are not unique individuals, but rather providers of food, warmth, and/or care. But an infant that goes through a healthy development gradually grows out of such a state of primary narcissism. They start to see others as meaningful individuals, and through their childhood, start to develop the capacity for loving others. This is when they start to realize that the needs of others are just as important as their own needs. However, some people fail to grow out of this state. Eric Fromm writes, "But narcissism exists also in later stages of life. If the growing child fails to develop the capacity for love, or loses it again, narcissism is the essence of all severe psychic pathology." He then continues, "For the narcissistically involved person, there is only one reality: that of his own thought processes." Feelings and needs. The world outside is not experienced or perceived objectively, i.e., as existing in its own terms, conditions, and needs. The most extreme form of narcissism is to be seen in all forms of insanity. So, in other words, the lack of relatedness. The lack of capacity and ability for an individual to properly love another is a sign of narcissism, which can easily lead to insanity. Transcendence. Another aspect of the human situation, closely connected with the need for relatedness, is man's situation as a creature. And his need to transcend this very state of the passive creature. Us humans are very unique compared to other species in the sense that we are aware of our mortality, and perhaps correlated to this awareness is the fact that we do not want to simply survive by having enough food and shelter. We, as humans, do not want to live a passive life. We want to transcend idleness. And pursue something meaningful. This is the second human need for mental sanity mentioned by Eric Fromm: our need to transcend animal-like existences. But being endowed with reason and imagination, he cannot be content with the passive role of the creature, with the role of dice cast out of a cup. He is driven by the urge to transcend the role of the creature. The accidentalness and passivity of his existence, by becoming a creator. So, how can we transcend this role of a passive creature? Eric Fromm argues that by the action of creating, we can all experience this desired transcendence. Act of creating in the sense of creating visual art, music, writing, poetry, architecture, vehicles. Food, the list goes on. Even creating a new life or community falls under the umbrella of creation. Creation gives us humans a sense of purpose and meaning, a reason to live rather than just existing. But what if an individual does not have the means to create? What if the individual wants to transcend passive existence? But is not sure how to do so in a meaningful manner. Eric Fromm writes, "To create presupposes activity and care. It presupposes love for that which one creates. How then does man solve the problem of transcending himself if he is not capable of creating, if he cannot love? 
There is another answer to this need for transcendence. If I cannot create life, I can destroy it. To destroy life makes one also transcend it. Indeed, that man can destroy life is just as miraculous a feat as that he can create it, for life is the miracle, the inexplicable. This is a chilling observation made by Eric Fromm. He is essentially stating that the act of creation and the act of destruction are two sides of the same coin. We all have the innate need to transcend life, but depending on how we choose to do it, there is an immense difference in the outcomes. Thus, the ultimate choice for man. And as much as he is driven to transcend himself, is to create, or to destroy, to love, or to hate. Rootedness. Every adult is in need of help, of warmth, of protection, in many ways differing. And yet, in many ways similar to the needs of the child, Eric Fromm says that the feeling of rootedness is another essential human need. The idea of relatedness we discussed earlier is about how individuals connect with others on a smaller scale, whereas rootedness is more about how we connect on a larger scale. Almost all humans have experienced a sense of security and rootedness in their infant years, through their relationship with their mothers. And Eric Fromm argues that as we grow up, we need to replace this sense of rootedness in other ways, in order to feel emotionally stable and grounded. Otherwise, insanity will ensue. He brings up our home country and religion as primary examples. The family and the clan, and later on the state, nation, or church, assume the same function which the individual mother had originally for the child. The individual leans on them, feels rooted in them, has his sense of identity as a part of them, and not as an individual apart from them. The person who does not belong to the same clan is considered as alien and dangerous. As not sharing in the same human qualities which only the own clan possesses, just like transcendence, where there are two opposing methods to satisfy the need, rootedness offers two conflicting results. The positive aspect is the feeling of security and being grounded, while the negative aspect is that it might discourage individuals from venturing outside of their comfort zones. While having a certain community or entity as one's home base can be beneficial for one's mental health, if they are overly attached to it, it can actually hinder their personal growth, resulting in suboptimal mental well-being. Throughout this section, Eric Fromm repeatedly discusses how special a child's bond with the mother is, and makes a very interesting point. Here lies the reason why individuals who have not overcome the fixation to mother often try to procure motherly love in a neurotic, magical way by making themselves helpless, sick, or by regressing emotionally to the stage of an infant. The magic idea is: if I make myself into a helpless child, mother is bound to appear and take care of me. So what he is stating here is that if for some reason someone cannot grow out of the initial attachment to their mothers, they are more likely to look for bonds and ties from a weaker, victim-like standpoint. This makes it all too easy for them to submit to whatever clan offering them comfort and stability, and creates individuals that will blindly succumb to any agenda pushed by the group. And from this point, mob mentality can arise very quickly. The average man today obtains his sense of identity from his belonging to a nation, rather than from his being a son of man. His objectivity, that is, 
his reason, is warped by this fixation. He judges the stranger with different criteria than the members of his own clan. His feelings toward the stranger are equally warped. Those who are not familiar by bonds of blood and soil, expressed by common language, customs, food, songs, etc., are looked upon with suspicion, and paranoid delusions about them can spring up at the slightest provocation. This incestuous fixation not only poisons the relationship of the individual to the stranger, but to the members of his own clan and to himself. The person who has not freed himself from the ties to blood and soil is not yet fully born as a human being. His capacity for love and reason are crippled. He does not experience himself nor his fellow man in their, in his own, human reality. Here, Eric Frum describes someone who blindly submits to an entity, all because of their need for rootedness. As we can see here, when the search for rootedness and groundedness is done improperly, it can lead to significant distortion of reality and mental insanity. Sense of Identity Man, being torn away from nature, being endowed with reason and imagination, needs to form a concept of himself. It needs to say and to feel I am I. The next human need, a sense of identity, is just as vital as the previous three mentioned, and if individuals cannot find ways to satisfy it, they will not remain sane. This concept of identity is closely related to the idea of rootedness we just discussed, as well as relatedness. We briefly mentioned how relatedness is small scale and rootedness is a large scale way of being connected to others. The sense of identity is more of an inward manifestation of the human need for connection, whereas rootedness is more outward. Both rootedness and sense of identity can affect each other. Eric Frum points out that beginning in the Renaissance, when the feudal system broke down, the majority of the population lost their traditional roles in society and started to question their identity. Only a minority of the population was able to experience a true sense of individual identity. This idea is very much relevant today as well. This need for a strong identity is the driving force behind the pursuit for fame and status as well as conforming to certain cliques or ideologies. The need to feel a sense of identity stems from the very condition of human existence, and it is the source of the most intense strivings. Since I cannot remain sane without the sense of I, I am driven to do almost anything to acquire this sense. Behind the intense passion for status and conformity is this very need, and it is sometimes even stronger than the need for physical survival. Frame of Orientation The fact that man has reason and imagination leads not only to the necessity for having a sense of his own identity, but also for orienting himself in the world intellectually. The fifth and final human need discussed by Eric Frum is the frame of orientation. In essence, this is an individual's moral compass, which guides them spiritually and intellectually in the society they live in. Having a frame of orientation helps people decide what is right and wrong, as well as what is important and what is trivial. Eric Frum warns us by saying, the further his reason develops, the more adequate becomes his system of orientation, that is, the more it approximates reality. But even if man's frame of orientation is utterly illusory, 
It satisfies his need for some picture which is meaningful to him. So that is the pitfall we need to watch out for, because any kind of frame of orientation will satisfy our need for one. It doesn't necessarily have to be a good one or a just one. We naturally tend to just crave any set of principles, as long as we have one to latch onto. And once we grab onto a bad one, it might be very difficult to get out of it. Let's see why that might be. Eric from breaks down the difference between reason and intelligence. Reason is man's faculty for grasping the world by thought, in contradiction to intelligence, which is man's ability to manipulate the world with the help of thought. Reason is man's instrument for arriving at the truth. Intelligence is man's instrument for manipulating the world more successfully. The former is essentially human. The latter belongs to the animal part of man. This is a very interesting distinction that he makes between reason and intelligence. Very often, we believe that these two are similar, not opposing forces. But Eric Frum goes out of his way to show us that they are not the same. Reason is based on objective reality. But intelligence can be used to justify delusion. He ties this in with our need for a frame of orientation by stating the following: the need for a frame of orientation exists on two levels. The first and the more fundamental need is to have some frame of orientation, regardless of whether it is true or false. Unless man has such a subjectively satisfactory frame of orientation, he cannot live sanely. On the second level, the need is to be in touch with reality by reason, to grasp the world objectively. But the necessity to develop his reason is not as immediate as that to develop some frame of orientation, since what is at stake for man in the latter case. Is his happiness and serenity, and not his sanity. This becomes very clear if we study the function of rationalization. This is why some people can get stuck in a bad environment or an organization. Our need for any kind of frame of orientation is much stronger than our need to be rational. This is also why we see people who seem to be smart and educated end up rationalizing and supporting ideas that seem objectively wrong and off. This distinction between reason and intelligence is only mentioned in this portion of the book, but it's also a key to understanding how people will fall into bad lifestyles. And make questionable life choices to satisfy the other human needs discussed earlier. Once they fall into a certain lifestyle or mindset, as long as they have some intelligence, they can easily justify their choices, even if they are harmful. However unreasonable or immoral an action may be, man has an insuperable urge to rationalize it. That is, to prove to himself. And to others, that his action is determined by reason, common sense, or at least conventional morality. He has little difficulty in acting irrationally, but it is almost impossible for him not to give his action the appearance of reasonable motivation. So those are the five human needs discussed by Eric Frum. While the elaborate examination of these needs are very insightful, it still leaves us with various questions regarding the premise of this work. Can we satisfy all these needs in a positive manner in today's society? How does our society promote insanity in individuals? What large-scale changes could we make to foster a sane society? In part two, we will take a look at these questions by examining the rest of the sane society. 
thank you for watching.